Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we said in our manifesto and repeatedly during our elections campaign that in this government, this five year, we will begin or rather continue the modernization of our legislative landscape in almost every area of human endeavor. The public health sector, Mr. Speaker, is most important on the government's agenda for obvious reasons. And therefore, the public health sector will be the target of massive modern reforms in the years to come. This is only a single step in that direction. Mr. Speaker, this is obviously a very complex, a highly expert, and a very sophisticated piece of legislation. As we have heard from the experts in the field, from the mouth of the Honorable Minister himself, Dr. Frank Anthony, from the Honorable Member Vishwa Mahadeo, and from the Honorable Member Dr. Karen Cummings, transplant, blood transfusion, and the implantation of bodily organs have been with us for decades. Some statistics suggest even centuries. And we have been doing it in Guyana, according to the Honorable Minister, since 2008 in terms of bodily organs and way before that in relation to the blood transfusion. However, we were doing it in a very unregulated way. And the medical profession felt that the time has come for us to bring infrastructural regulation to the way that this science was being done in our country. And I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that this bill was completely inspired and worked on by our medical profession, the medical experts of our country. There was no political hand here. There was not, while the Honorable Member Minister was generous and charitable enough to recognize the efforts of the Attorney General Chambers, we were merely described as we took the specific and very complex instructions from those who are qualified in the areas to give it. And Mr. Speaker, this bill, like many others that we will bring, enjoys a very, very long and consultative process. The Honorable Minister listed a constellation of medical personnel, both in and out of Guyana, and organizations that contributed significantly to this effort. And Mr. Speaker, having regard to certain statements made by the Honorable Member Dr. Cummings, I want to specifically reiterate for the record that the expertise from the Guyana Medical Association, the um, Medical Association of Guyana and the medical profession itself, there was a, in fact a unit established bearing the name Human Organ and Tissue Transplant Bill that was formed to pilot this process and they work closely with the drafting team. In particular, Mr. Speaker, we got expert guidance from PAHO and WHO advisory team of experts on transplantation and blood services. And this came as a, and, and in the process, Mr. Speaker, we consulted Trinidad and Tobago, which has had such a legislation since the year 2000. We were doing this 21 years after that. Obviously, 
we looked at Trinidad and any person acquainted with how drafting is being done, you borrow what exists before with a view, of course, to improve it based upon the developments that would have taken place since that was done in that country. And we did that with Trinidad and Tobago. And we got expert guidance from Dr. Hasina Mohammed. And that person helped and showed us where we needed to improve from the Trinidad model. So the other member, Dr. Karen Cummins, uh, statements that we copied from Trinidad and we mimicked Nicolette Henry or the Honor of Nicolette Henry is completely uninformed. Yes, we borrowed from Trinidad as we borrowed from the United States of America, as we borrowed from Canada, as we borrowed from the United Kingdom, as we borrowed from the European community, as we borrowed from Belgium, as we borrowed from Croatia, as we borrowed from India. Nothing is wrong with that. There is no need to in reinvent the wheel when there is a model that you can work with, you can massage, and you can get it to meet the peculiarities and idiosyncrasies of your society. That is how laws are drafted all across the world. And there is nothing wrong with that. Mr. Speaker, this bill captures the basic international requirements that such a bill must contain. And they are set out in great detail right across from the beginning to the end of the bill. The bill is numbered pages up to pages 75. It's not a small bill. And the reason why it is so elaborate the reason why it is so comprehensive is because of the nature of the task at hand and the complexity of the issues. So all the issues that we have heard about children rights, about consent, about prohibition, they are all captured in the bill. For example, I heard the Honorable Dr. Karen Cummings lamenting the fact that the bill does not contain an adequate regime of provisions that relate to prohibition against um, illegal transfer or unauthorized use of bodily organs. And that is not true. That is simply not true. Part 10 of the bill deals specifically with that. It has a series of offenses and it continues on to the miscellaneous section for about four or five pages, simply listing offenses. So a person shall not remove or cause to be removed any organ tissue, blah, 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 blah. And any person who does that commits an offense and shall be liable on a conviction to a fine of five million and to imprisonment for five years. Any person who advertise the donation, the, the, the that put advertisements in relation to the selling or buying commits an offense. Any person who unauthorizedly removes or performs one of these op operations commits an offense. And there are a series of offenses here. And these offenses are what would have been in all standard pieces of legislation that exist across the Commonwealth and in the United States of America. So I don't understand what is the basis for you making that statement, Honorable Member. The Honorable Member looked at Trinidad and Tobago. I just, I took a photograph of the Trinidad and Tobago legislation that the Honorable Member referred to. And the Honorable Member made a comparison with our uh, bill at Clause 51 and said that we borrowed it from Trinidad but that our own contains a mistake which Trinidad doesn't have. But let me read our bill and then I'll read the Trinidad version of it. Any contract or arrangement is void under which a person agrees for valuable consideration, whether given or to be given to the person or to another person, 
A, to the sale or supply of any organ, tissue, cell, or blood, or other biofluid from the person's body or from the body of another person, or, and this is the objectionable part, to the sale or supply of blood, whether before or after the person's death or the death of the other person. The other rebel member saying that Trinidad doesn't speak to transferal of blood after death because according to her, it's medically impossible for that to be done. That's the impression I got. But listen to what the Trinidadian statute says, the relevant portion. A person, sorry, um, subject to this section, any contract or arrangement under which a person agrees for valuable consideration, whether given or to be given to himself or to another person, to the sale or the supply of any tissue from his body or from the body of another person, or to the sale or supply of blood, whether before or after his death, or the death of the other person, as the case may be, is void. The identical thing is captured in our legislation. Identical. Transfusion of blood after death. Yet the Honorable Member stands with a straight face and says that we copied, but we copied wrong from Trinidad. Where Trinidad has the identical thing. And honorable member, let me explain to you whether or not it is medically possible to transfuse blood after death is not the issue. Any person who does that commits a criminal offense. It has nothing to do with biology, it has to do with a crime. So I am shouting because I can't imagine that a doctor would come to this house and pretend to speak about a bill dealing with medicine and be so misleading. That is the type of irresponsibility that we cannot encourage in the House. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member also had great objection to the Minister being given powers to over the agency, and the agency is a very important unit in the infrastructure of this bill. But Mr. Speaker, let me read what those powers are. The minister may, may, first of all, may, so that's permissive, it's not mandatory, give to the agency any special or general policy directives with respect to the carrying out of its functions under the act as the minister considers necessary or expedient. What is wrong with a minister who has responsibility for the health sector giving policy directions to an agency of this type? What is wrong with that? That is what the people of Guyana elected this government to do. To govern the country and give policy directions where policy directions are necessary. The Honorable Member Kemal Dramjatan had one's portfolio over the police and that identical statutory formulation is in the Police Act that the Minister of Home Affairs shall give general and specific direct policy directions to the police force. The G every piece of legislation that has a subject minister will have a linguistic formulation of that type. That is how government exercises governmental policy control over the administration of the state. That is the role of a government. That is why a government is elected by the people of Guyana. So I don't understand how you can find that objectionable. And the worst part of it is, the honorable member stood on that podium and found in this bill that there were some elements here, of course, which he did not dilate and detail for us, some elements in this bill inspire and encourage ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing. Now, you have to be of a special mind to read a bill that is so scientific so clinical, so dispassionate, so sophisticated, so deep in clinical medicine 
and on earth from that ethnic cleansing. I, I, I don't understand. Something is wrong with some people's minds, Mr. Speaker. Something is wrong. And then the Honorable Member read into this bill also grave platforms for corruption. This bill has the only part of it that has a, that accused this government, accused the government and says that she is not, the Honorable Member is not sure whether the government will manage this bill and will not make it corrupt. The government has nothing to do with this bill and the management of this bill other than the minister having a role to give policy directions of a general and special nature. But that is the type of misleading information and misinformation that is disseminated, disseminated out there and people believe it. The same thing they have done with the NRF bill. The same thing they have done with the NRF bill, although as I have said repeatedly, that bill is about 80% their bill. Yet, it's a recipe for corruption and the thiefing of resources. That is what they do, Mr. Speaker. They come here, they don't read the bill, or either if they read it, they don't understand it. They don't understand what they read, but they give their mouth a lot of liberty and contribute to an avalanche of misinformation. Mr. Speaker, this bill protects all the persons in our society who require protection. Our minors, there is a whole regime of protection to ensure that minors' interests are safeguarded. And minor is def defined in the bill as a person under 18 years old. And this bill has a series of protective mechanism. These mechanisms were not hatched up at the chambers of the Attorney General. They were pulled from existing regime of protection across the globe. And I have cited the jurisdiction to which we have taken in order to present this bill. The Honorable Member Dr. Karen Cummins spoke at length about death but we have, we spent a long time in determining, in prescribing how death is to be determined because different jurisdictions based upon the available technology and based upon their, I suppose, philosophy, they have different definition of what constitutes death. The British definition is different from the American definition. The one in Trinidad and Tobago is also different. We carefully constructed one that we felt is conducive and proper and appropriate for the level of technological advancement that exists in Guyana so that we can properly apply and diagnose death in the most accurate way. And that is captured in clause 47 of the bill, 48 of the bill. A person is considered dead when there has occurred a irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions of that person or a reversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including brain stem of that person. This definition alone took us about three weeks before we arrived at this. And this received the export input of a number of persons. The Honorable Member Minister spoke about Dr. Professor Kishan Narayan, very celebrated professor at Calvary University. I have his views here when he finished the work and we send the final draft to him. 
He said this, let me share what he said. He said, generally, this draft of the document is solid and superb as it addresses all aspects of human tissue transplant. This guy, for your information, Professor Kishen Narayan, BSc, MD, PhD, FETCS, Faculty of Medicine, University of Calgary, Libin Cardiovascular Institute of Alberta, Canada, former co-director, Cardiac Transplantation, University of Gent, Belgium. Belgium. That is the man's qualifications only, just behind his name. And these are the type of expertise that we had available at our disposal. And we didn't accept their export recommendation wholesale. Our local medical team sat down with the drafters and ensure that we, in those technical areas, we came up with a formulation of language that would capture what we want, peculiarly in our society, if we don't want what is generally out there. So, honorable member, this bill is comprehensive. It is the most modern expression of its type in the English-speaking Caribbean. We are leading the way in this bill and in this type of medical technology. Mr. Speaker, we also ensure that the bill contains a power vested in the Honorable Minister to promulgate regulations because a bill of this type has to remain fluid while we have captured the foundational pillars the main concepts and the fundamental precepts of the infrastructure, this bill will be an ongoing, evolving exercise. And the regulatory making power of the minister will allow, obviously upon consultation with our legal, our medical fraternity, to allow for there to be appropriate regulations in order to lend expediency and efficiency and efficacy to the letter, spirit, concepts, and conceptual objectives which are captured in this bill. We also had the legal advisor to the Medical Council, uh, Mr. Kamaram Karan, who is now quite experienced in that post as he has served there for more than a decade. He also brought a legal perspective to the bill. And he discussed it, I am, I am sure, with his legal counterparts in the legal profession. So, Mr. Speaker, this bill is a commendable effort on the part of the government. It is revolutionary. It is groundbreaking. Of course, we may come back here with amendments as we begin to put the bill into force. We don't pretend that this is the perfect first effort. It is the first effort. We have regulatory making powers that will supplement the bill when necessary. But I believe and I'm confident that this is a great first effort and it will advance the medical and public health welfare of our people and our country. And I have no hesitation in commending this bill to the House. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.